A movie was released in 2004 uh, by a director named M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, the movie was titled The Village. Now this uh, movie depicts a small community of people living in rural Pennsylvania. They are living in some sort of a forest uh, or a village surrounded by a forest. And because it's a forest, it is, it is surrounded by some dreaded beasts or monsters. And this movie seems to be in late 1800s, uh, 19th century. So, so the people in this village are forced to live in that because of those dreaded beasts and, and monsters at the fringe of that village. This village is governed by certain elders. These elders believe that the world outside the confines of this village is, is an evil world. It's a big, bad world outside. It's, it's evil. It's deteriorating by the day. So they want to preserve the sanctity, the purity, the innocence of these villagers, of this village. There is a young girl, a young blind girl named Ivy Walker. She falls in love with this guy named Lucius. Ivy Walker is the daughter of the chief elder, Edward Walker. Now Lucius is injured, he is on the verge of death, and therefore he needs some medical attention. Now their village is not equipped to handle that case. So Ivy decides to do something unthinkable. She decides to go outside the confines of that village, outside that forest, to get some help for her lover, Lucius. So she makes that bold move. She runs for the edge of that forest. And while she's running, she encounters these beasts, these monsters. And while she is negotiating with them, she, she realizes that those monsters, those, those beasts, are not real. They're basically the village elders in costume. And she negotiates with them. She runs towards that wall, and she climbs that wall. And that's where the plot unfolds. As she jumps out of the wall, she jumps right onto a highway and she meets a ranger, a cop. And while she's, remember she's blind, so while she's talking to this man, she realizes that they are not actually living in the 1800s. They're not living in 19th century. In fact, they're living in 21st century. Their clothes, their mannerisms, their language, everything reflected 19th century village. The elders thought that they could preserve the innocence, the love, the sanctity, the purity of those people of that, or that village from the evil, the ever deteriorating world. But they underestimated the evil within. They tried to create a city of subsidy within the city, a culture within the culture by building walls and putting monsters out there. They tried to build a city within the city. See, one of the key themes in the Bible is a tale of the two cities. The city of God and the city of man. You see, God created his own city in the Garden of Eden. Perfect, beautiful, pristine, sinless. But sin vandalized that city. The devil in the form of the servant entered that city and sin vandalized that city and thereby it established a city of man. A city that is corrupt. A city that looks for its own preservation, self-preservation, self-glorification. A depraved and a perverse city. You see, the pinnacle of the city in Genesis 11, where man outrightly defies God's command to go, multiply, and subdue the earth. Rather, they do the opposite thing. They come together to build this huge structure whose, whose pinnacle touches the heavens. Why? Because they wanted to make a mark for themselves. The city of man and God destroys it and calls it Babel or Babel. God gives birth to a nation by calling it out of Egypt, redeeming it out of Egypt, and says, I promise you a new city, the city of God, a city flowing with milk and honey, Canaan. Go redeem that city. Drive out the people. Redeem that city. That's the city that I'm giving you, the city of God. But, that, but you see, as you read the Old Testament, the city of man again takes over and perverts the city of God. So the city of man has such stigma attached to it. 
Such stigma attached to it that even today, in our own context, we try and run from it. We, as Christians, we build this, this virtual city, this virtual wall around us so that the influence from outside doesn't penetrate in and people are not willing to go outside or forced not to go outside because the city is filled with perversion idols and every kind of sinful activity. Like those villagers in rural Pennsylvania, we try and build city walls, virtual walls around us. And in that endeavor, we forget that our purpose is to penetrate, is to go in the city of man and redeem it and turn it into the city of God, transform it into the city of God. Our vision at DBF Central is to cultivate Christ-centered communities, not to build a wall around us, but to redeem Delhi and beyond for the glory of God. We exist to cultivate Christ-centered communities. Why? To redeem Delhi and beyond for the glory of God. But the question is, if we have erected these walls around us, how on earth are we ever going to redeem Delhi? Forget the beyond part. God tells us three ways, three ways we should, three ways we ought to conduct ourselves, live our lives to redeem Delhi and beyond, to redeem the city of man and transform it into city of God. Our passage today is Jeremiah 29 verses 1 to 7. Jeremiah 29 verses 1 to 7. Before we get into the passage, let me give you the context. Verses 1 to 3 give you actually the context of what's happening there. Now Israel, the crown jewel of God, Israel has been ravaged. Israel has been conquered by the world power at that time, Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. The policy, the war policy of this nation, Babylon, was that when they subjugate a nation, when they conquer a nation, they would take the cream of the crop. The best of the best, the best minds, uh, the best artists, the best craftsmen, the best warriors, the best generals. And they would take them to their city, their nation, so that they can have the best of the resources available in their nation. So when Nebuchadnezzar subjugates Israel and conquers Israel, he takes the best of the best, even Daniel. He takes them to Babylon and raises Jerusalem to ground. Now people sitting on the fringe of the Babylon are weeping. And they, they are, they're filled with despair. They're wondering what just happened. How come the city of God, the nation of God, got ravaged and vandalized? And, and there, if you see in chapter 28, a prophet named Hananiah, he comes and he prophesies. He says, two years, just two years, and God is going to take you back. And people say, okay, two years, I can manage. Two years, I can live out of a suitcase. I don't have to engage. I don't have to assimilate. I can live out of a suitcase. I can build walls around myself and my community and my family so that I don't have to do anything with this God-forsaken people. I don't have to engage with them. I don't have to deal with this evil people. And in the face of, God, in the face of that situation, God sends this message. Verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. Why? That they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. God is saying, engage with the city at all levels. You're not going to go home in two years. I am not sending you home in two years. In fact, I'm going to keep you here for 70 years, God says. 70 years, not two years. So engage with the city at all levels. Invest, transact, build relationships. Do your vocation, farm in this nation in essence, live a normal life, settle in, unpack in this city 
And Israel would turn around and say, Lord, do you really want me to settle in, to engage with, to assimilate with this people? Uncouth barbarians, do you want me to engage with this godless people? And God says, yes, I want you to engage. What does it mean for us? You see, the Bible tells us that, that our permanent dwelling, our eternal home, our home forever is not this. Is not this. It's with God. The author of the book of Hebrews talking about Abraham in, in Hebrew chapter 11 verse 10, he says, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. John tells us in Revelation 21 verses 1 to 3, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a, a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. So you see, this, this city or this, or this earth, even this earth, is not your permanent dwelling. In fact, you open First Peter and first, uh, Peter talks about in chapter 1 and in chapter 2, he calls the followers of Christ as exiles. Now the word exile means resident alien. What does that mean? That means while you are a permanent resident of the city of God, you have been commissioned to be in the city of man temporarily for a while. Think of it as a diplomat. Think of it as an expat who is commissioned from one country to go to another country to do some business. You're representing your country in another country. He's saying you are a resident alien. God has commissioned you from city of God, from the city of God to go to the city of man and represent your country. Your hometown, if you were. You see, a lot of you are not from Delhi. There are few of you who are thoroughbred. I am a thoroughbred. I've been here all my life. My parents have been here. Some of you are second, third, fourth generation Delhiites. Let me ask you this question. Have you unpacked yet? Do you know what's happening in your neighborhood? How many people come into your house or how many houses do you go to that do not belong to the people from your community, people from your tribe, people from your language? How do you engage with the city? You see, the God, God's purpose for our lives is to go into the city of man, redeem it and transform it into the city of God. Are you always surrounded with people who are like you, who look like you, who talk like you? Or have the same belief? Always? If God has called you here, God wants you to engage with the city. That means engaging with the social, economic, judicial, institutional, educational fabric of the city. How are you engaging with the city? Are you still sitting on the fringe Wondering when God is going to take you back. Engaging with the city means making friends and giving them time outside your community, your tribe, your language. It means working with people and employing people who are outside your community, tribe and tongue. Or even ethnicity. It means getting involved in the matters of your neighbors, especially those who are not from your community. You know, it's funny that I'm talking about creating a sub-city within the city, creating a city within the city, when we have already gone three layers down. So there is a city. Okay, there's a city. Let's say Delhi, city of man. Then there's church within the city. And within the church, there's another city. In fact, several cities. If you want to see an example of it, go outside after the service, you'll see. You see the lunch hangouts, you see the evening hangouts, you'll see cities within the city. You know what I'm talking about.
If there is evil within, how can we fight the evil outside? If we have multiple cities right here. So the first way to redeem and transform is purposeful engagement. Engage with the city at all levels. But God says to Israel, engagement is not enough. That's not enough. I want you to go one level deeper. I want you to commit to this city. You see, people can engage at a very superficial and transactional level. As long as the city, the city of man, is fulfilling all my dreams and desires. As long as the city of Delhi is giving me my financial goals, giving me my marital goals, giving me my relational goals, my educational goals, my career goals, I am going to engage with this city. But the day, the moment the city turns on me, or the moment, the day, the life becomes difficult in this city, I am going to run away from this city. You know what's that called? That's called a fling. Do you know what a fling is? Fling is a relationship between two people where there is no commitment whatsoever. There are mutual benefits. As long as my, my needs are being met, I'm going to stay in this relationship. But the moment the other person becomes nagging, the other person starts demanding, the other person becomes troublesome for me, I'm going to say thank you so much and don't want to see you again. That's flirting and God says, don't flirt with the city. Don't flirt with the city. Verse 7. He says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. The word welfare there is a Hebrew word shalom. Now the word shalom does not have any English equivalent. Many words together, English words together, they together bring the meaning to the word shalom. It's a beautiful word. It's hard to define. But I found a definition, a simple, easy definition. Shalom is the way things are ought to be. Shalom is the way God created things to be, the natural order. So when God tells the Israelites to seek, to seek the shalom of Babylon, he's saying seek the ultimate good of this city. Seek the welfare of this city. Be invested in it. Commit to it. You see, you can't seek the shalom of the city by standing on the fringe, by engaging at a superficial level. In order for you to commit, you have to be invested. In order for you to seek the welfare of the city, you have to be committed to that city. You have to be totally invested in this city. Now the question you will turn around and ask, look, I work nine to seven in a corporate, in a government job. I study in university or in school or I'm a retired grandparent. How can I seek the welfare of the city? I am no good. I'm nobody. I have no power to seek the welfare of this city. Verse 27, God says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you. Israel thought that it was because of Babylonian power that they were there. But in the face of that perception, God says, no, I have sent you there. If you're thinking you are in the city of Delhi because of his educational pull, because of its financial pull, because of its career pull, because of the political pull, God says, I have placed you here. Is that news for you? You thought you were here because, well, you got good marks in university, therefore, or you got a good job here. God says, I have sent you. God in his sovereignty, God in his, in his providence has placed you where you are. So how can I seek the welfare of the city? Seek the welfare of your context, your office, your university. You all have a sphere of influence, no matter how large or how small that influence is. Seek the welfare of the people around you. I'm not talking about buildings. Don't seek the welfare of a building. Seek the welfare of people around you. 
whether it is government office, whether it is your corporate, whether it is your university, your school, your neighborhood. All of you have neighborhoods. You don't live in a forest. If you do, then okay. Commit to the city. If each of you play your part well, if each of you be the salt and light which Jesus has called to be in your context, you would see the city of man redeemed and transformed into the city of God. As individual, we need to engage and commit. And as a body, we need to engage and commit. But the danger is, when you unpack, when you assimilate, when you immerse yourself in the city of man, there's a danger, and the danger is of losing yourself, of forgetting who you are, why you are, why you are here, and whose you are. You get consumed by it. You see, the city of man, as dilapidated as it is, it is as sinful as it is, it's very attractive still. Especially, it's very attractive to that little sinful person in you that desires fame, that desires success, that desires to climb the ladders and be in the upper echelons of the corporates or government. The city offers you fame, glory, and we get sucked into it. Sucked into it, and we lose our identity, and we forget why we were here in the first place. We forget the mission. And we're like, I'm settling down. Or at least you start behaving like as if you're settling down. Verse 7, part B. The Lord says, pray to the Lord on its behalf. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. But, the, but Lord, why should I pray for this city? Pray so that you don't forget who you are, whose you are, and why you are here. The Lord says, pray for this city. Pray for the city of man to me so that you don't forget who you are. You're on your knees praying for the city constantly. Isaiah 62, verse 6 and 7. Isaiah says, on your walls, O Jerusalem, I have set a watchman. All the day and all the night, they shall never be silent. You who put the Lord in remembrance, talking about prayer, take no rest. And give him, talking about God, no rest until he establishes Jerusalem, the city of God, and makes it a praise in the earth, the city of man. He calls for people to pray incessantly. He calls for people to pray unceasingly till the time God answers. He's talking about like Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah, he negotiated with God. He's talking about that woman in Luke 18 who's trying to get justice out of this judge. She, she snags that judge. She perseveres. He's talking about Jacob who wrestles with a man only to realize that he's not wrestling with a man, he's wrestling with God. And he says, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. Isaiah is saying, pray, pray, pray for the city of man. Pray when you walk the corridors, pray for your university, pray for your school, pray for your neighborhood, pray for your offices, pray as you walk the corridors, pray as you cross the parliament, pray as you cross the Supreme Court and other government headquarters. Pray when you cross places like GB Road and other slums. Pray when you cross the religious strongholds. Pray for the city of God to be established. Martin Lloyd-Jones, he said, give him no rest, give yourself no rest. Keep on, bombard God, bombard heaven until the answers come. Don't stop. Don't stop. So engage, commit, pray. See, there are two hurdles, two hurdles. One is Delhi is a harsh city. Delhi is an obnoxious city. 
is not warm. I mean, it's warm in one sense, but it's very cold in the other. It's unsafe, it's polluted, it's congested, it's dirty, it's filthy. Two minutes you go out of your house and you've had it with the city. <laughs> the moment you put your hand on the steering wheel, you've had it with the city. And you turn around and say, how God, how can I love this city? How can I seek the welfare of the city? Is it possible? The second problem is that I can't do this balance between resident and alien. Okay, either it's resident, permanent, or alien. Absolutely temporary. Just like two years or one year. I can't do the balance. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. I can't do it. Either I unpack or I don't unpack. This middle business is not possible. I can't do it. I get confused. I get entangled. It's a battle. And I seem to be losing that battle. Is that even possible? I want you to fix your eyes on Jesus. He left the city of God, literally speaking. And he came to the city of man. He engaged. He stepped into time. He became his own creation. We can't even begin to fathom what that means. He hungered, he thirsted, he, he wept, he got angry, he engaged, he assimilated, he committed. He knew that Jerusalem will take his life, yet he set his face towards Jerusalem like a flint. He was so committed to the city, to redeem the city of man. He prayed. He was out praying most of the nights. I wondered what he prayed for. But he prayed. I'm sure he prayed for the city. Jesus has set the model of redemption before us. In fact, he is the redemption. He is the redemption. When Jesus enters Jerusalem in the Passion Week, people look at him riding on a donkey, and they say, Hosanna, Hosanna. That means save us. They look at this man, this prophet, this rabbi Jesus, and they realize he is the redemption. He can redeem the city of man. He can redeem Israel. When I go out and I see the condition of the city, I wonder when Jesus is going to walk in. When I go out and I see justice being sold to the highest bidder, I wonder when Jesus is going to walk in. When I see poverty ravaging the city, I wonder when Jesus is going to walk in. When I see rich becoming richer and poor becoming poorer, I wonder when Jesus is going to walk in. Jesus is the hope and no other. Engage, assimilate, pray. We exist to cultivate Christ-centered communities to redeem Delhi and beyond for the glory of God.